Barnaby, um, the bombing of this hospital has had an incredible amount of impact, regardless of what caused it. But what's your what's your take on this? Do you have an interpretation? Israel ordered 22 hospitals evacuated. The World Health Organization called that a death sentence for patients in those hospitals who couldn't be moved and so were being left to die. One of the hospitals that Israel ordered evacuated was the hospital that has now been bombed. So Israel said it was going to bomb hospitals. Then a hospital got bombed. Israel's dropped more bombs on Gaza this week than America dropped on Afghanistan in the first year of their occupation of Afghanistan in 2001. Fadi Diab, a priest in Ramallah, said, we hold the occupying power responsible. If it's good enough for a priest, it's good enough for me. And we know that Israel continues to block electricity from baby incubators and dialysis patients. We know that Israel continues to block water from surgeons and elderly people. I mean, people in Gaza don't have access to clean water, food from survivors. And we know that Israel bombs roads after it tells people to flee along those roads. We also know that on October the 14th, Israel targeted ambulances. And we know that before this bombing, Israel had already killed 28 medical staff in Gaza. We know too, as you said, that part of the Israeli playbook is to lie about the attacks, the murders. It doesn't please me to say this. In 1996, Israel shelled a UN compound in Lebanon, blamed it on others. It wasn't true. In 2006, Israel murdered an entire family on a beach in Gaza. The IDF had a quick investigation that, uh, uh, that said the IDF wasn't responsible. It wasn't true. In 2014, Mark Regev, we've seen him again on our TV screens recently, claimed that UNRWA sites, that's UN Refugee and Works Agency sites, were used to launch missiles. The UN investigated it wasn't true. Last year, Israeli forces murdered Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akleh, blamed Palestinians. It wasn't true. Journalists can't really investigate what's going on in Gaza because even the Washington Post, which is not, I tell you, a friend of the Palestinian people, says it is, quote, becoming impossible to report from Gaza under the conditions of siege and bombardment that Israel has established. So part of what concerns me here, looking at the Western media, because this whole brutal siege and bombardment campaign by Israel has been an object lesson in the racism that structures everything in our media ecosystem. It has been quite well, I want to say extraordinary, but uh, I haven't even been that surprised to watch uh, Western journalists rush to report an old blood libel, to rush to report that 40 babies were beheaded by bloodthirsty, savage Palestinians, even though it later turned out there wasn't much evidence for it, completely ignore, by the way, Hamas's accounts of what happened in their attack and just report the Israeli accounts. But then when Israel says, despite this record of lying, when Israel says that they're not sure who bombed this hospital or blames Palestinians for killing their own children, uh, journalists rush to say, of course, we must be measured and take them seriously, including, I should say, some left-wing journalists. And that's concerning to people because it seems to be a kind of double standard that is uh, uh, reeks of racism. Uh, Raz Siegel, the uh, Israeli genocide expert, is calling what happens in Gaza a textbook case of genocide now. 800 legal scholars have written that they are, quote, compelled to sound the alarm about the possibility of genocide in Gaza. It is clear that Israel is targeting civilians. They've targeted residential buildings. They've targeted journalists. They've targeted medics and medical facilities. This isn't the first case. The question we, I think, should ask is why they're doing this. Why this brutal blanket campaign, cutting off water. If you didn't want to target civilians, you wouldn't cut off water and you wouldn't cut off fuel. Why are they doing it? They don't need to. They have an Iron Dome missile defense system that means that most missiles the Palestinians fire into Israel don't reach targets. They could negotiate the release of hostages. There are 6,000 uh, uh, Palestinian prisoners languishing in Israeli jails without receiving fair trials, serious allegations of torture, uh, which we rarely hear about on the news, though we hear much about Israeli hostages in Gaza. They could negotiate for the release of their hostages. Instead, they're bombing Gaza and killing, by some reports, some of their own hostages. This won't, of course, destroy Hamas. When you carpet bomb people who are living under a colonial siege and constant bombardment, the only effect it can have is to strengthen people's fury, anger, and resolve to resist the colonizing power. So of course it won't break resistance. Even if they were to destroy the Hamas infrastructure, something else would emerge in its place. So why? Why are they doing this? It's not, by the way, because Hamas caused the problem, because in the West Bank, where there is no Hamas regime, settlers have attacked funerals in the last week and launched attacks on Palestinian villages, killing parents and children, and the IDF has shot and 
killed 62 Palestinians in the last week, uh, when I last checked, uh, in the West Bank, which is a place that does not have a Hamas government. And before this latest massacre, 2023 was already the deadliest year on record for children in the West Bank, with one child murdered every week by Israeli forces. So it isn't because there's a resistance enclave that Israel's violent. It seems to have this lashing out violent impulse uh, regardless. The reason is that it's the logic of the colonizer. The reason is that Israelis know deep down, and I'm speaking here of some of my own family members, so it pains me to say it, but they know deep down that they are living in other people's stolen homes. They know that they are living in a state that was premised on an act of ethnic cleansing when 700,000 Palestinians were driven from their homes. That's why Gaza is so densely populated, because most of the Palestinians living in Gaza aren't from Gaza. They're refugees penned in there because they were chased out of other parts of Israel. And that's why the important thing to do now is not simply to call for peace, not simply to call for the end of this massacre, though that is crucial, but to understand that we want a world in which people don't live penned into an open air prison because they're chased from their homes, to call not simply for peace, but for freedom. And to say when we see people partying at a rave and then being killed by Hamas operatives, that they were partying five miles away from an open air prison. If, if you move five miles from where those people were partying in Israel to Gaza, life expectancy drops 10 years. We don't just want peace and the return of a world in which that is the case. We desperately want, desperately want people all over the world in our millions for freedom, for everyone to be able to live a life of freedom and dignity. Um, and, and that's why we want victory uh, for the Palestinian people. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with most of that. I suppose on this question of verification, I mean, you've, you've sort of then given, given a political position, which I'm very sympathetic towards. Um, when it comes to do you just say, okay, well, this was an Israeli airstrike, I will take you back. I mean, in, 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 in what you just said, you were saying there are many journalists who are willing to put on their front pages that 40 babies were beheaded with zero evidence. Um, and then, you know, we, we did a video sort of critiquing that, saying there's no verification for this. Um, I actually, I mean, we haven't really covered any of this stuff which is being put out by people who have gone rec on record and sort of said, oh, we saw this and that brutality in the, in the kibbutzes. Because I think if it's just based on one or two um, sort of eyewitnesses who also probably have some political prejudices themselves, that's not good enough for, for us to report it. So then uh, there is a similar situation here now, whereby if there are doubts, then you should say, it appears to be this or it appears to be that. And to be honest, that shouldn't have that much impact on the politics of all of this, because we know that Israel is definitely doing enough bad stuff to not have to necessarily rule out the possibility that this could have been something else. I mean, I think we will see, you know, more forensic evidence from sort of people over the next days and, and weeks. Because to me, I think both options are possible, right? I, I, I don't think my solidarity with Palestinian people is dependent on on which one of these is, is true. But both to me do seem possible. And I do think that sort of as journalists, not just as political activists, you do have to sort of take account of the fact that verification does matter. Obviously, you need to, you know, uphold both sides um, to, to that standard. I mean, what do you make of that? I think you should think about the context of the last week and a half in which we have witnessed the insidious dehumanization of the Palestinian people. They beheaded 40 babies, they blew up their own hospital, and they have been compared, including by some commentators on the British left, to Nazis and pogromists. Um, who are you talking about kind here? Of, on the, well, who, who, well uh, if you want names, uh, Paul Mason uh, says that, that compares Palestinians uh, breaking out of a cage um, and, and entering Israel as part of a guerrilla war when they've been left with no negotiations process, no uh, precise weapons uh, guided missile technology. He compares them to carrying out pogroms, which is an insult both to Palestinians in a cage and to my ancestors who were genuine victims of pogroms and weren't colonial settlers who'd stolen people's land. Um, I saw Owen Jones saying, if we really want to name names, I saw Owen Jones saying, talking about the Hamas attack as the most Jews dying since the Holocaust. Again, deeply, deeply insulting both to Palestinians and to those who were murdered in the Holocaust. So that kind of dehumanization functions to legitimate the massacre of people because it makes these people, Palestinians, um, something disgusting and, um, and, and bigoted and savage and violent. And there's just a very long history of this that you should be aware of. There's a very long history of when the colonized strike back and say very clearly that they're striking back for freedom and dignity, they are discussed instead as bloodthirsty savages
savages who have a lust for chaos and destruction, and that's why they're fighting. And that kind of language functions to legitimate the colonial violence that is then meted out to them. So when a hospital is blown up and the Israeli state says it was the Palestinians, they killed their own children, you should be aware that it's not simply unbiased journalistic integrity to report that claim. There's a, there's a deep, very, very violent ideological pressure at work in that claim. And it troubles me. It troubles me because I am the descendant of people who for 2,000 years, white Christian Europe excluded and said eventually was subhuman Jews. Um, and so I see this language when Israelis talk about human animals, when Israelis talk about children of darkness, as Netanyahu did, when Israelis talk about the law of the jungle. This is the language that was developed to exclude and murder and persecute my people, Jews. It was then used across Africa and Asia and South America to exclude and murder and brutalize people. Israel is just the latest iteration of violent colonial Western power. It's no surprise that America and Britain support it. They developed that kind of racist language and they're still drowning thousands of people every year in the Mediterranean. So that's the kind of racist world order we live in. And that's the kind of racist world order that allows Israeli politicians to be blasé about the claim that Palestinians kill their own children. I, I just feel like you're conflating quite a lot of things there. So you're, you're conflating sort of the Palestinian government, call, sorry, not the, the Israeli government calling Palestinians children. And I mean, I, I wouldn't use this sort of Holocaust comparison, but I suppose what people were talking about there and what I assume Owen was talking about there is, is why people are upset about this, why, why people would be upset by a lot of civilians getting killed in Israel. You know, even though you say you well, know, there, there, there was some well, unfairness what? to the fact that people can party next to the Gaza wall. But still, I think people should, you know, put forward some sympathy to people who are just going to a party and the parents of those people who are just going to a party. And I suppose I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you're almost disagreeing with that. Well, I don't think that anyone dying is ever a good thing. I think that anyone dying is a tragedy. I have never been deliberately starved by a colonial power that chased me from my land. So I try not to judge the actions of people who have been in that position. I live in Britain, where our government sends weapons to Israel. What we can do is not spend our time um, condemning and attacking the actions of the people killed with the bombs that our taxes fund, but instead try to ensure that our taxes no longer fund those bombs. We all celebrate Nelson Mandela, the majority of people killed by the ANC in their armed struggle campaign were, were civilians. The ANC felt that that armed struggle campaign was necessary to end a system of racist dehumanization in South Africa. Mandela was called a terrorist for it and attacked for it. There's a long history of this kind of thing. I'm concerned with stopping our money going to murdering Palestinian uh, men, women, and children. Um, and I think that time spent attacking Palestinians for the military strategies that they choose um, um, is frankly offensive and insulting, given that none of us have ever lived for decades under a, 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 a occupation and blockade. I mean, so as far as I understand it, though, the ANC example was quite different. I, I, I think they, they didn't kill that many. I think it was sort of in the, in the low hundreds over the whole campaign. Then they ended up sort of renouncing it. And I suppose part of the anti-apartheid struggle was in a way about sort of building links to, I mean, obviously it was, it was outside pressure. It was rebellion. It was uh, a, 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 a huge um, boycott and sanctions from the outside, which is why I'm in favor of BDS. But I don't think they sort of necessarily went to things such as sort of music festivals and just killed lots of people. Like to me, there's not only moral problems with that, it seems a bit strategically odd. I suppose strategically that makes sense if you're going for this sort of Algeria model, which is you're trying to scare people so much that they sort of leave your land and you can take it back. Um, I mean, potentially that's what people are going for. I'm just not sure if that's particularly realistic in, in this situation because I think, you know, the people of Israel are somewhat different to the French Algerians who are in, in Algeria. I really, really, really don't want people to be killed at music festivals. I want a world in which, frankly, I really, really like music festivals. I want a world in which we can all dance at music festivals and be free. Um, I don't want a world in which people dance at music festivals five miles away from an open air prison camp in which more than half the population is food insecure, in which in this ter territory, Gaza, which is, was partly dependent on fishing, 85% of its fishing waters are controlled by Israel. And every single aspect of the movement of people in the territory is so controlled by Israel that they can cut off food and water water and fuel at will. I don't think that's a normal situation that should be allowed to continue. I want there to be strikes and nonviolent resistance and no one to be harmed in the march to freedom. Of course I want that. Everyone wants that. But in a situation in which for decades the Israeli state has occupied and oppressed and besieged and bombarded Palestinians, for people in the West who have not been in that position to spend their time condemning the things that Palestinians do when our governments fund the Israeli war machine, I just think it's the wrong uh, choice of our attention. I think that's wrong. And I think that to compare Palestinians, and you said you wouldn't do this, but to compare Palestinians to anti-Semitic persecutors of Jews who rounded us up just for living in Europe, 
and put us eventually in gas chambers to compare, to, to, to tar Europe's shame at its failure to prevent centuries of anti-Semitism and to accuse Palestinians who did not carry out the Holocaust, Europeans did, to accuse Palestinians of that because they just want to live in peace and freedom, I think is, it's just frankly sickening. It genuinely, genuinely sickens me. It's an insult to generations of my family members who were butchered by the same kind of brutality and exclusion that said some people are human animals that now we see carried out by the state of Israel. Yes, those people, those people in the state of Israel are Jews, but they've just taken on, they've taken on the European Gentiles way of thinking about the world. They've taken on all the violence that they call Western civilization, which says some people have rights and other people don't. And so just as we had to break the back of czarism, and just we had to break the back of, of, of every anti-Semitic regime, and just we had to break the back of European colonialism everywhere, we have to break the back of the Zionist state so that everyone can be free. Everyone can live in peace and freedom. But, you know, yeah, I mean, like Palestinians, uh, what, uh, I don't know what Palestinians are supposed to do. You know, Israel was about to normalize relations with Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, the, Israel has completely divided the Palestinian liberation movement so that in the West Bank, they have a kind of puppet regime in the Palestinian Authority, which has guns that it doesn't turn on the Israeli state, but on Palestinian protesters sympathizing with Gaza. Uh, the Palestinian movement is divided. It doesn't have uh, regional uh, allies, very few regional allies. Um, the situation is pretty brutal and Palestinians are trying to find a way to, 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 to march for freedom. And when they march peacefully, Peacefully. When they marched peacefully a few years ago up to the wall that Israel has constructed to keep them from their homes, Israel shot and killed them. When they tried to be Gandhi, and Israel shot and killed them. Well, I mean, they also shot and killed a bunch of Gandhi's people, and he still kept on being Gandhi. But I'm not saying we should judge them for that. I suppose, I think where we differ is I agree the absolute focus should be on the crimes of Israel because they are the occupying power. That's what we do on this show. We spend 95% of our time talking about that. I do think on the left, there is a sort of reluctance to say, well, if you then spend 5% of your time saying, I also think that massacring people at a music festival is wrong, you are somehow undermining the Palestinian cause. I think we disagree on that, but we should move on. I'm sure we will come back to similar issues. Um, let's go to our next story.